Welcome to Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert, a podcast sponsored by the Healing Lives Center. Discover how to love and lead your family well and biblically. God created sex, marriage, and the family for our stewardship, growth, and benefit. My heart and passion is to teach, train, educate, and disciple Christians that want strong marriages and families. The Healing Life Center has been serving Christians since the year 2000. Its mission is to be a center for sex, trauma, and marriage education and transformation, where we offer counseling, coaching, courses, and speaking services to you, your church, or ministry. Check us out at HealingLives.com. Hey, hey, welcome back. Uh, we are walking through this book, Lost in Transnation, A Child Psychiatrist Guide Out of the Madness by Miriam Grossman, MD. And today we're looking at chapter eight. Chapter eight goes into a very important subject for us parents, educators, dangerous ideas. So what's going on in the school system and what's gonna potentially go on in your own home and how this comes um, to play for us as parents. This chapter starts off with a um, story of a young lady named Heather um, and how she goes through some very serious mental health um, crises and, and breakups and then she's in a psychiatric situation which they automatically endorse her claiming to be um, hairy, they, them. And then what do we do as parents? Because this, this, as we've seen, this church, the, the, the um, um, medical system is going to embrace it. Um, she comes back home and as parents you say, hey, school, boundary. She is to be called Heather. Um, what, do you, what do we do? So two months into the school year, another mom from the school casually mentioned that Harry was using the boys' bathroom. The principal pointed to district policy instructing schools to respect students' wishes. Um, even after explicit written instructions from parents and mental health professionals, the school had secretly facilitated Heather's social transition. Her parents put their foot down, but the school wouldn't budge. So we've got a major problem here. Um, next section header, a child is not a miniature adult. And so Dr. Grossman says, I began fighting transgender ideology in schools years ago. In 2013, I traveled to Sacramento to testify against Senate Bill 48, legislation mandating instruction in the, quote, the cultural and racial diversity of our society, starting in kindergarten. The bill seemed reasonable. Who doesn't want their child to learn about the contributions of Americans of diverse races? but included in California's list of diversity was transgenderism. In my testimony, I pointed out that what was co once common sense, the authors of this bill have ignored the fundamental principles of child development. Children process and integrate information and experiences differently than adults. There are facts that a child cannot easily assimilate because he simply lacks the tools to do so. A child is not a miniature adult, I reminded legislatures. That's why we have movie ratings and computer filters. And I continued. This bill mandates the in introduction of ideas into the classroom without considering the capacity of the students to absorb them. For example, transgenderism, the idea that nature made a mistake and a person is trapped in the wrong body. The idea that a person might ask a doctor to remove a normal body part. These are difficult concepts for adults to comprehend, let alone children. Please tell me, how does one explain to first graders in an age-appropriate way the idea of a person coming to a doctor and asking for critical body parts to be removed. There is no age appropriate way that that can be done. This bill ignores the principles of normal child development, which are that at around age three, a boy knows that he is a boy. He identifies himself as a boy. He's called, uh, that's called gender identity. By age four, the boy should know that he will grow up and become a man. That's called gender stability. By six and seven, at the latest, a child, say a boy, should know that he cannot become a girl even if he wears a dress. That's called gender permanence. If this bill becomes law, these principles go out the window. Children will learn that gender permanence does not exist. They'll be led to believe a woman can turn into a man and a man into a woman. It is our responsibility to protect children as best we can from exposure to facts and experiences that they are not equipped to handle. Certainly we can teach children the importance of respect and tolerance in a manner that is consistent with child development and biological truth. I thought my proposal was a no-brainer, but the California legislature passed the bill, opening the door to increasingly aggressive indoctrination of students like Heather. Does your children's school follow the model legislated by California Senate Bill 48? 
If so, diversity refers not only to race, ethnicity, and sex, but to transgender identifying individuals. Therefore, if you don't accept your child's opposite sex identity, you're no better than a racist. Your home is unsafe, and your child might be better off with a different family. A Wisconsin high school displayed a sign, if your parents aren't accepting of your identity, I'm your mom now. Wow. In deep red Oklahoma, a tattooed eighth grade teacher with a unique hairstyle posted a video announcing, if your parents don't accept you for who you are, F them, I'm your parents now. Wow. Another teacher proudly posted a video criticizing the right-wing idea of parents' rights. Sporting a nose ring and rainbow glasses, the teacher declared parents' rights as literally just fascism. Parents and caregivers who reject their children's gender identities are not taking care of their children. Tell that to Heather's parents. The, the pain and sacrifice they endured trying to help her could fill ch several chapters. No matter. To this teacher, Heather's mother and father are not taking care of her and their legal rights are fascism. In this book, I'm t talking about dangerous ideas. The dangerous idea of educators is we know better than you what's best for your kids. Wow. So what's going on at the library? Students, especially young ones, look up to their teachers. Teachers know everything and are never mistaken. When classrooms are decorated with trans posters and rainbow flags and slogans, it shapes students' attitudes. One California teacher packed up the American flag in her classroom. It made her feel uncomfortable. After a student asked to which flag he should pledge allegiance, she supported. She suggested the gay pride and trans flag. When an elementary school teacher displayed a pride library in her class with rainbow banners and books about changing pronouns, students perceive her wishes, what she hopes they'll believe. Speaking of books, entire sections of School libraries feature transgender content. The Los Angeles Unified School District received an enormous donation of LGBTQIA-themed books from Open Books, previously called Gender Nation, an organization that celebrates transgender identities in children. We've already talked about one book on LA school shelves, likely in your school library too, I Am Jazz. I Am Jazz was published in 2014. You met the author in Chapter 3. Jazz explains... I have a girl brain, but a boy body. This is called transgender. I was born this way. From a medical perspective, that's nonsense. But your child is innocent and trusting. Your four-year-old will believe her teacher when she states, with certainty, the only way to really know if someone is a boy or girl is to ask them. Hain Gano, a famed child psychologist, said, Children are like wet cement. Whatever falls on them makes an impression. Parents, Everything your child sees and hears shapes her little heart, mind, and soul. Activist educators know that. From the youngest age, children absorb beliefs about transgenderism in their classroom, their books, for the Disney Channel, and even from their Legos. The bombardment of falsehoods without opportunity to question is called indoctrination. Lies are not presented as theory, but as unquestionable truths. Jazz, jazz was born in the wrong body. The doctors did make a mistake in identifying Jazz as a boy. Therefore, Jazz's body must be aligned with drugs and surgeries. Listening to I Am Jazz in preschool, your son is led to believe boy and girl are random designations and could very well be incorrect. I remind you that this is an article of faith. The idea will be repeated endless times. No one should be surprised then when he might wonder, maybe I'm a girl too. Maybe my sister is a boy. My mom a man? A 2022 poll found that only 18% of those over 65 believe gender is an identity that is distinct from a person's biological sex. That number rose to 27% for 45 to 64 year olds, 46% for those between 30 and 44 years old, and a whopping 61% for 18 to 29 year olds. Trust me, those numbers are only going up. The researchers didn't question anyone under 18. But I bet you up to 90% of grade schoolers think sex has no bearing on gender. Why? Because they're more familiar with I Am Jazz than with the cat in the hat. And because of teachers like the one in North Carolina who taught her preschoolers about colors using flashcards that depicted a pregnant man. Preschool. That's three to four year olds being taught that men can have babies. The danger 
of social transition. We've discussed trans ideologies spread through websites, social media, and peer groups, but schools are perhaps most influential. Students not only respect teachers, they give schools the best hours of their day when their alertness and possibility of engagement are at their peak. Social transition is the public adoption of a new gender identity, including some or all of the following, a new name and pronouns, altering one's presentation such as clothing, hairstyle, makeup, etc., use of opposite sex facilities like bathrooms and locker rooms. It may also include a chest binding or genital tucking. Social transition is sometimes called social affirmation, an Orwellian term if there ever was one, because what it affirms is your child's rejection of their body, their material reality. With social affirmation, you and other adults endorse the child's belief he or she is in the wrong body. But there's no such thing. Affirming a falsehood is not a loving gesture, especially when it leads to harm. For Heather, social transitioning meant living a double life. At home, she was Heather, and at school, she was Harry. Her mother called her down to dinner. Her teacher called on them to answer a question. For an emotionally disturbed girl seeking to escape her biological reality, living out to different personalities was destabilizing, but the school did it anyway. Most parents think affirmation is the decent thing to do, and I can already hear their objections. What's the harm of new names and pronouns? Kids go through phases. It's not like medical transitioning. Social transition is completely reversible. Affirmation has a positive connotation, and when ideologues chose that word, it was a strategic move. Affirming your child seems kind of kind and loving. Instead of distressed, she's comfortable. She's happy, but it's not kind or loving to validate an untruth. Adults have a responsibility to represent reality. The reality is your daughter's sex was established at conception. If you fail to convey that, that truth, and if your daughter's school allows her to secretly adopt a new persona, she could be mo moving in a perilous direction. Some studies show social transition improves short-term mental health. Others do not. How about the long-term impact of social affirmation on teens like Heather with ROGD, the rapid onset gender dysphoria? We don't know. We do know this. With the younger kids, supporting an opposite sex identity makes it more likely the child will remain dysphoric. A Dutch study found effective cross-gender identification and a social role transition were associated with the persistence of, gender, of childhood gender dysphoria. Dr. Kenneth Zucker agreed, social transition of prepubertal children will increase dramatically the rate of gender dysphoria persistence. Pediatrics reported, of children who were six to seven years old when they socially transitioned, by the age of 11 to 12, 97.5% remained transgender identified or non-binary. In case you're still wondering what that is, I will remind you of my 15-year-old patient's definition. It basically means I haven't figured this SHIT out yet. Might jazz have desisted? It's certainly possible. Remember, by young adulthood, 61 to 88% of early onset kids, depending on the study, cease wanting to be the other sex. But almost every child who socially transitions continues to reject their sex. So social transition is a big deal. It's not a simple kindness or show of respect. If you validate your son's girl identity, you agree that his body is wrong and should be rejected. You confirm the disconnect between his mind and his physical reality. You agree he knows best who he is and what he needs. And you inform everyone else in his life to follow suit, to change how they speak, change how they think. Putting aside whether any of that is sensible, think of the impact on your son. He feels he's a girl, and you agree. He wants to run the show, and you're stepping aside. I'm listening to, I'm listened to, I'm special. I'm getting so much attention at home and school. Adults are making big changes for me. He's never felt so empowered. You're tur you've turbocharged his self-esteem. Of course it feels good, <laughs> at least temporarily. Consider also the possibility that your son's social affirmation may affect the wiring of his brain. You heard me right. Neuroplasticity 
is the well-established phenomenon in which thinking, behavior, and experience alter brain microstructure. Each time your son hears his new name and pronouns, it's a learning experience that creates a memory. We all know repetition is key to learning. We know as well that the brain is constantly rewiring. Its structure is changing in response to life experiences. Back to Heather. From a plasticity perspective, each instance of being called Harry and they them is another learning experience for her brain. That's one reason Harry's or Heather's parents objected to Harry and I supported them. The new name and pronouns concretize her false beliefs, perhaps even on a cellular level. Hayne Gano was right. Kids' brains are like wet cement, and over time, that cement hardens. If your son is told yes, he is a boy and uses a male name, pronouns, and clothes, that changes how he thinks of himself. I wonder when my professional organization, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, advises parents to use the name and gender pronouns your child prefers, do they give any thought to these legitimate questions? There's another issue to consider. What if after one or two years or more, your son starts to doubt? He's not sure about his girl identity after all. Now he has a dilemma. Yes, he had been so sure his parents, teachers, friends, therapists, principal, and even the lunch lady went through the trouble of accepting his new identity and getting used to his new name and pronouns. Everyone was careful not to misgender or dead name him. There, was, there were many phone calls and appointments and meetings. He got to use the girl's bathroom. Maybe it caused conflict within the family between you and your spouse, siblings, your grandparents. You went through a lot, all for him because he was so sure. How do you make a U-turn after all that? Even an adult would need lots of confidence and courage. Iatrogenic persistence, iatrogenic. Dr. Zucker calls social transition a psychosocial intervention with the likely consequence of subsequent lifelong biomedical treatments, gender affirming hormonal treatment and surgery. He argues it's an intervention often conducted by schools and other institutions unqualified to implement such a course of treatment. In 2014, the American Psychological Association, APA, warned, premature labeling of gender identity should be avoided and early social transitions should be approached with caution to avoid foreclosing the stage of transgender identity development. <laughs> wow. They added that social transition might be challenging to reverse even if the person is no longer gender dysphoric. Dr. Hilary Cass, whom you read about in Chapter 6, allows for social transition in some cases. But in her investigative reports of GIDS, she warned that social transition is not a neutral act, but an active intervention because of the profound impact it has on a child's psychology. Still think that social transitioning is no big deal? That Heather's parents overreacted? Here's Dr. Stephen Levine's opinion. With rare exceptions, educators do not have the professional training and experience necessary to guide children and parents through the difficult and potentially life-altering decisions surrounding social transition to a transgender identity. Social ident transition of prepubertal children is a major experimental and controversial psychotherapeutic intervention that substan substantially changes outcomes. Studies conducted before before the widespread use of social transition for young children reported desistance rates in the range of 80 to 98 percent. A more recent study reported that fewer than 20 percent of boys who engaged in a partial or complete social transition before puberty, before puberty had desisted when surveyed at age 15 or more or older. Some vocal practitioners of prompt affirmation and social transition even claimed that essentially no children who come to their clinics exhibiting gender dysphoria or cross-gender identification desist in that, that identification and return to a gender identity consistent with their biological sex. So Dr. Levine was referencing a 2022 study by pro-affirmation researcher Christina Olson, who inadvertently confirmed that 98% of gender dysphoric children affirmed at an early age remain transgender after five years. Rehoming your child. Is your child leading a double life, a boy under your roof, a girl at school? 
Do peers and teachers call him by a girl's name and pronouns? Because he wears a dress and lipstick in this, uh, perhaps he wears a dress and lipstick in his geometry class? You may want to check. The daughter of January and Jeffrey Littlejohn in Tallahassee, Florida, became gender confused during the pandemic. When her school reopened, officials asked her gender preference without her parents' permission. When January called the school about it, they were tight-lipped. They said by law they couldn't share what they had discussed in secret with the 13-year-old unless her daughter consented. Only later did the Little Johns discover their daughter had signed a gender non-conforming student support plan with their school's vice principal, guidance counselor, and social worker. The plan included questions about which bathroom their daughter wanted to use, which sex she wanted to room with on overnight trips, and most damaging, how the school should refer to her when they speak to her parents. These adults, at least one of whom was a stranger, were conducting a psychosocial intervention on a young girl without her parents' consent. The Little Johns discovered the district policy stated, parents are not to be informed when their children announce a transgender identity with school personnel. Parents in Massachusetts sued middle school teachers alleging they were secretly urging their children to socially transition. The teachers were intentionally concealing that information from the parents. The school district asserts that students may decide to discuss their gender identity openly and may decide when, with whom, and how much to share private information. One teacher in that Massachusetts school, Bonnie Manchester, thought it was wrong to keep what she knew from parents. She told one of the dads for that the sixth grade daughter that his sixth grade daughter changed her name and pronouns at school, and for that, Manchester was fired. California teacher Jessica Tapia faced a similar crisis. She asked her district, are you asking me to lie to parents about their child? The district answered, yes, it's the law. Jessica refused to lie if a student came out as trans and refused to allow boys in the girls' locker room. She too was fired. These aren't isolated instances in deep blue localities. Undermining parents is built into the education system. Consider the case of Amy Canava, a school psychologist in Virginia. She fought against a proposed Virginia policy requiring schools in inform parents when their child starts to present at the, um, as the opposite sex. You have to sometimes break rules to do good for kids, she said on a podcast, later adding in another episode, I recognize that parental consent is a big deal, but when, I, when I'm doing anything LGBT, I don't worry about that. Let's be honest, it's an electronic permission slip. You type in a parent's name and I'm like, oh, that parent signed consent. There's no actual signature. On a private message board for the organization Pride Liberation Project, Canava was featured as a point of contact for kids who face familial rejection. And it said, In the event of you needing to leave your home, we can provide you with emergency housing from a supportive, queer-friendly adult. You might be familiar with the term rehome, meaning to find a new home, typically in reference to a pet. The word is now applied to children. As a child psychiatrist, I'm aware there are homes that are unsafe and rare instances in which children must live elsewhere. But we have to examine this closely. Because if you, if you choose to call, keep calling your gender dysphoric son or daughter their given name, A.B. Canava, and others probably consider that familial rejection, the group offers to pick him or her up within one or two days and take them to a kind and affirming home. Canava is the chair of the National Association of School Psychologists, their LGBTQI2S committee, a prominent position in an influential pro professional organization. The NASP is in the bag for hiding your child's new identity from you. Their guidelines instruct school psychologists to maintain confidentiality of the student's birth sex, gender identity, and gender expression by keeping identifying records separate and limiting unnecessary disclosure, doing so only with the explicit assent of the student. The NASP is only one of numerous professional associations shaping school policies and training school personnel that have been captured by gender activists. The National Association of Secondary School Principals calls for schools to allow social transition 
including cross-sex dressing and use of opposite-sex locker rooms, restrooms, and overnight facilities. If parents wonder what's going on, NASSP threatens disclosure of transgender status to other school staff or parents could violate the school's obligations under FERPA's FERPA or constitutional privacy protections. Do you see what I mean? School staff believe they know better than you what's good for your child. The American School Counselor Association, ASCA, recommends using special markers to note when a student uses a new name unbeknownst to parents. If students have not disclosed their gender identity to a parent or guardian, the group says, their chosen affirmed name should be noted as preferred name in the system. Meanwhile, the right to privacy and prohibition of disclosing students' gender identity extends to students' parents' guardians. In the face of legislation, to restrict trans indoctrination and require parental notification of a child's gender identity, the former president and current ethics chairman of ASCA, Carolyn Stone, told members at their annual 2022 conference to, quote, learn the rules so you know how to break them. And yes, I'm quoting the chair of ethics. How about the National Education Association? Privacy and confidentiality are critically important for transgender students who do not have supportive families. So it is important to have a plan in place to help avoid any mistakes or slip ups. The Department of Education. Schools should maintain the confidentiality of a student's birth name or sex assigned at birth if the student wishes to keep this information private. The National Association of Social Workers. Let transgender kids decide when to come out and to whom. Do not disclose the identity of young people who are LGBTQI2S without their permission. I hope you understand. All these powerful groups believe you don't have a right to know your teen daughter is changing in the boys' locker room and that if you have an issue with that, maybe it's time to rehome her. Glistening Classrooms Think of all these groups as satellites of a mothership called G-L-S-E-N, pronounced GLSEN, formerly the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. They've been laying siege to our educational system since 1990. If there's a single organization responsible for transforming your child's teacher, principal, and guidance counselor into gender warriors and filling your child's classroom with trans symbols, books, and flags, it's Gleason. In their own words, Gleason strives to dismantle all identity-based oppressions in K-12 public and private schools. We're talking about a large operation here. Among many other activists, Gleason provides teachers training, teacher training, lesson plans, school policy guides, inclusive curriculum, and gender and sexuality alliance clubs in schools nationwide. They collaborate with associations that accredit private and public schools and maintain a public policy office in Washington. A priority is recruiting students. This is done through GSA clubs and teacher indoctrination, of course, but also through school programs, always clothed in the language of respect, civil rights, and freedom. As Gleason explains to students on their website, the purpose of programs such as Day of Silence and Solidarity Week is to give you the tools that you need to urge your school to address and help end anti-LGBTQ plus bullying and help build a school community around solidarity and respect for all. Respect for all? Sure, unless your daughter prefers to pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, then she's a hate-filled fascist transphobe. Do you really think anyone is going to sit with her in the lunchroom? Gleason instructs all school staff to immediately upon um, her request affirm your daughter's boy identity by using her new name and pronouns. This mandate extends to her peers. And Gleason doesn't fool around. Having a policy that clearly affirms a student's right to use the name and pronouns that are consistent with their gender identity is essential for the health and safety of the student. While mistakes happen, it is important for staff, faculty, and peers to make every effort to correct mistakes, ensure they are not repeated, and address any intentional misuse of students' names or name or pronouns. They're instructing schools that misgendering and dead naming should not be tolerated as per the Articles of Faith. Gleason's edict includes your daughter's right, without her permission or knowledge, to use the boys' restrooms, locker rooms, and changing facilities, 
and to, partic to participate in all boys' physical education, athletic, and other extracurricular activities. All she needs to sue, do is say the word. Here's how Gleason instructs her child's school to keep you in the dark. Some transgender and non-binary students may not yet be out of their parent, out to their parents or guardians. It is essential to have open communication and plans established with the student to go over potential circumstances. For instance, uh, mail be, may be sent home with a student's prior um, and or legal name, which may not be their affirmed name. If a student is not yet out to their parents' guardians, using their prior name as in correspondence may be a desirable um, course of action, although they, are, they use a different name amongst peers and educators in school. Educators and staff should work closely with the student to determine what changes are necessary and where to ensure their safety and well-being. Now you understand, don't you? What happened at Heather's school to the Little Johns to teachers Bonnie Manchester in, in Massachusetts and Jessica Tapia in California? The same thing is happening all over the country, and I consider it grooming. Grooming is emotional and psychological manipulation in order to exploit someone at a later point in time. Often grooming is sexual, but it doesn't have to be. The grooming that's taking place in schools is ideological. Glisten seeks to convert your children and add them to their ranks of believers. After 30 years, it's a well-oiled and well-funded process. A final note to parents about Gleason. Their website features a special function. Hitting the escape button three times takes you to the Google homepage. That's for your kids to secretly ingest their content and when you walk in, to exit quickly. Erosion of the parent-child bond. When gender evangelists drive a wedge between you and your child, it harms both of you. Dr. Erica Anderson, the first transgender president of US PATH, a regional affiliate of WPATH, said this about secret social transitions. It's well established that one of the most important factors in helping gender questioning children is family support. So to, to deliberately deprive a child of support at a time potentially when they most need it is, I think, a serious error in judgment. Studies, one of them involving 90,000 American teens, are unequivocally, unequivocal. Teenagers with strong emotional bonds to their parents fare better. A child must be attached to those responsible for her. Attachment is based in part on trust and honesty. When a school facilitates a, a student's social affirmation in the absence of parental consent, it encourages secrecy, distrust, and a double life. This is unhealthy, will increase tension and conflict in the home, and may pre precipitate emotional struggles. If your daughter has different identities at school and, and at home, she um, she, using the black and white thinking of her immature mind, may decide school, not home, fulfills her need for love, understanding, and support. School, not home, nurtures and protects her. School is safe and home unsafe. With rare exceptions, these are dangerous untruths. They erode her attachment to you and threaten her development and the path to healthy adulthood. When school staff think they know better than you, and drive a wedge into your family, the results can be catastrophic. They were for Sage Lily. The start of Sage's story is sadly familiar to me. Sage had depression, anxiety, and a history of early trauma. The loss of both parents, followed by six foster home placements. When she was two, Sage was adopted by her parental grandparents. She began ninth grade and reported to her grandmother, Michelle, that all the kids were bi and trans and emo and gay and goth. Sage soon declared herself a boy at school, Draco. She wore boy's clothes and used the boy's bathroom. She requested the school not inform her parents, and they obliged. They did this knowing Sage had just been hospitalized for depression and was on psychiatric medication. Her parents remained in the dark until one day Sage told Michelle, the boys are following me, they're touching me, they're shoving me, they're threatening me with rape and violence. One day the school called Michelle to pick up Sage because she was distraught. Sage admitted that she was identifying as a boy at school and that she had been told by the counselor she could use the boy's bathroom. Michelle. 
she had been jacked up against the wall by a group of boys in the boys' bathroom and threatened with violence. Later, I learned that there was a rape, too. She was trying to hold back tears. I told her she could stay home from school and we could figure out what to do. But Sage disappeared that night, Michelle said. She actually thought she was meeting. I guess the counselor had um, given her uh, transgender sites. And she thought she was meeting a 16-year-old kid to go skateboarding, and it turned out to be a sex trafficker who groomed her online. Nine days later, the FBI found her in Baltimore, Maryland. She had survived cruel, abusive rapes, lost her virginity to multiple vile men, and then taken to D.C. and Maryland. And these men drugged and raped her and transported her to live with their family. That's a code word for sex traffickers to let the guy know that they're seasoning a new kid. There's a lot more to Sage's saga that you'll read in the next chapter. Suffice to say, she and her grandparents went through a hellish ordeal, and it all began with her secret social transition at school and her turning to transgender support sites. Whether the school counselor or someone else at school directed Sage to those sites is not clear. You must be vigilant and proactive regarding schools. You must be prepared to fight as Heather's parents did with a cease and desist order. Don't forget, you have the fundamental right, according to the Supreme Court, to control the upbringing and education of your children. One of my patients' parents wrote to me about the Catch-22 of asserting her preferences at school. From her seasoned perspective, it is a lose-lose situation. Quote, One of the big hurdles of this issue is the complexity of the legal, medical, and psychological framework that most people and parents can't comprehend until their kid is on the chopping block. Once you are in this mess, you have to deliberately but gently defuse the bomb, and battling the school will only paint you as transphobic and pit the child against the parent further. In my survey of 500 parents, many voiced regrets about the schools their child attended or still attends. I urge parents to remove their children from public school if possible. Homeschool is best, but not every family can do that. Whatever school you decide on, please scrutinize it and know your rights. The Stroop Effect When a young person demands the use of an opposite sex name and pronouns, or some variation thereof, it does not occur in a vacuum. Their social transition impacts everyone you know, especially their peers. Stara Stockton is a therapist who once wrote letters in support of hormones and surgeries for youth. Then the the dangers of gender ideology hit home. My child, he's 10, and he was explaining to me about his friend who transitioned. His first question, of course, was, did this child grow a vagina over the summer? Can I grow a vagina over the summer? How do I know I'm not next? And my son asked me, well, how do I know if I'm a boy? And I was just like, This is scary, and it is disorienting our children. Yes, it certainly is disorienting, just as I predicted 10 years ago in my Sacramento testimony. And to a child with underlying vulnerabilities, their peers' transformation can be destabilizing. To her credit, Stockton is now an outspoken critic of the affirming care she once supported. Consider also that following a student's declaration, for example, a boy announcing she, her pronouns, the school compels the use of those pronouns. Is this a simple matter it's made out to be, a a sign of decency and respect of others, like not cutting in line? Thanks to a parent, I recently learned about a phenomenon called the Stroop Effect, and it needs to be considered in any conversation about social transition. The Stroop Effect demonstrates the brain function is impacted when presented with a mismatched or incongruent stimulus. For example, it's quicker and easier to read red if the word appears in red rather than in another color. If red appears in green, it takes longer to read, and there is a higher likelihood of error. This has been tested and proven repeatedly. We do not understand the neurological mechanisms for the Stroop effect, but it's fair to ask, what effect might it have on the brain's of anyone trying to use wrong pronouns, but of youth in particular. Their friend was a boy, then one day he's a girl, and they must override their brain's perceived mismatch and call him her or else. 
This has to be particularly hard for children whose brains are developing, for the el elderly, and for anyone with pre-existing cognitive processing issues. Sage's grandfather, for example, you'll learn, uh, you'll soon hear Michelle describe the custody hearing at which the grandpa, who was in his 70s, kept forgetting to use Sage's boy name and use the male pronouns. The judge was livid and threatened to throw him out of the courtroom, but it was due to the Stroop effect, the incongruence of having to call his granddaughter he and use a name incongruent with who she was, it was nearly impossible. Even though he was trying to be compliant for the sake of a favorable hearing, he kept slipping back into the congruence his brain knew and understood. Finally, consider that students are told the identities of their peers are private. What happens at school stays at school. Your daughter isn't supposed to tell you she shares a bathroom with boys. That's an enormous secret, and as the incidences of assault by girls in boys' bathrooms attest, potentially a treacherous one. In this chapter, you've learned the catastrophes that may result when educators think they know better than you. Next, we look at child protective services and courts of law. They have dangerous, dangerous ideas, too. Thank you for tuning in to the Healing Lives with Corey Gilbert podcast. It has been an honor to serve. If you are struggling, have questions, or in need, Dr. Gilbert offers a free consultation for new clients. Check us out at HealingLives.com to book a call. If this has been helpful to you, please share it, leave a review, and help us get the word out so that we can see lives changed, marriages transformed, and more people come into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The Healing Life Center offers online courses, programs, books, intensives, and other services to help you live biblically and well. Discover more resources on YouTube and in Dr. Gilbert's Healing Marriage Facebook group, The Healing Marriage.